Doesn't seem possible, does it? Less than, what is it, two years ago, we had this little room here. Now we're reaching out all the way into the next county. It really is. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to watch? We say sometimes, I suppose we say all the time, that our activity is of God. I know I do in uh, this work continually remind myself that the infinite way is the activity of God and that I'm an instrument. And even though that is a continual reminder, Every once in a while, a personal sense of responsibility develops. And uh, like everyone else, I just wonder whether I'm doing enough or doing the right thing or um, working from the right standpoint. And then comes the rebuke that you have nothing to do with it. This is the activity of God. That happened a year or so ago, when a little concern arose as to whether or not the uh, infinite way ever would be organized if I didn't have my eye and hand on it. It hasn't been too easy to keep it from uh, being organized. And uh, as you know from the experience here at the center, as long as you have your freedom and the center has its freedom and the leader has her freedom, everyone gets along beautifully. But as you also know from other experience, the moment an activity of this kind becomes so organized that uh, we all owe each other obligations, then is when trouble sets in. And so one day I was meditating, pondering this idea of the organization and what would happen if uh, it were organized and how to prevent it being organized, when the voice broke right in and uh, said, the infinite way is the activity of God. God is capable of taking care of every function of it. Do not be concerned about its being organized. If anyone tries it, they'll be removed. Ever since then, it has become more and more clear that this is a principle that applies not only to the infinite way, but that applies to your business, your home, your activity, even your body. It becomes clearer as we go on that even your body is not your responsibility. Not even your health is your responsibility. All that concerns you or me is an activity of God, and uh, upon God rests the responsibility for maintaining and sustaining us. When we look around, we're apt to say, but God isn't doing a very good job certainly doesn't seem to be doing a good job with this world. And the answer comes back quickly that it isn't God who is failing, it is that we are taking over the responsibility from God. We are taking over God's responsibility and making ourselves personally responsible for things which should be left to the activity of mind, of life, of soul, spirit, principle, of the divine law. Usually, in these open talks or open lectures, the attempt is made to keep the 
work the message as simple as possible because of the many who attend open work who are not familiar with the work. But I know that in Seattle and in Portland this is not true. In both of these cities I can look out into the room and recognize more than three quarters of the people who sit here as people who have been studying the writings or hearing the recordings attending our classes when I'm here and our lecture work. And so tonight I'm going to take advantage of that and uh, instead of making this a talk or a lecture I'm going to turn it into a class or a class lesson. Most of you know that is the way I like to work. I'm not too much of a believer in reading truth or hearing truth. My conviction is that truth must be studied, practiced, and lived. And even those who do indulge in just reading it or listening to it must someday make the transition from readers and listeners to actual practitioners or students of the Word. There's something to that effect in Scripture. Be a doer of the Word. Be a doer of the Word. Now, proof itself is a marvelous study. And of course it is an interesting subject. But truth can only become demonstrable in our experience. That is, truth can only become tangible as outer harmonies in proportion as truth becomes embodied in our consciousness, as it becomes an activity of our consciousness. And it is for that reason that generalizing on the subject of truth is never very good, never very helpful except to introduce the subject. And I know that neither truth nor the infinite way needs any introduction here. Now, excuse me, can I be heard clearly back there? Oh, fine. It must be a year or more ago that we tried an experiment in this very room. Mrs. Clough had some circulars printed for us with about six, eight, or nine scriptural verses. And we used those here at a noon meeting. Every day for a week or two, we had a 15-minute period from 12.05 to 12.20. And uh, the purpose was to see what would happen if we followed a certain program. And we followed it, and some wonderful things happened to some of the students who came to those noon meetings. The experiment was this. Each day we took one of those scriptural passages and talked around it, about it, for about five, or six, seven minutes. And then each of those who attended went out and carried that scriptural verse, or the essence of it, into an actual experience during the day. In other words, if they went on the street, they immediately applied the understanding of that passage to the situation that they saw on the street. If they went into a market or a store to shop, they brought one of these scriptural passages to bear on the experience. And uh, what happened was this. 
instead of going into a store or a shop or an office and just doing business with people or having association with people, there was brought to conscious remembrance. Remember that, to conscious remembrance, conscious awareness, the fact that we were not doing business with these people, but with the Christ of their being, with the divine Son of their being. If some work was to be done by us, whether it was in an office or selling, the remembrance was on a certain day that he performeth that which is given me to do. He perfecteth that which concerneth me, and in that dropping the responsibility and watching what happened when we let that which we call God take over. Well, of course, you probably can't rebuild a world in a week or two, but we did have enough result to show what would happen if an individual practiced that every day for 30, 60, 90 days until it became an active and conscious working of their mind. Naturally, some of the fruitage of our work here in Portland is due to the fact that at this center, and in all of our work and Mrs. Clow's work, that very principle is embodied, the need to carry truth out into the world. Well, now we are at another stage of our unfoldment. And uh, at this point, let me say first of all that it is possible for anyone to change the trend of their lives within a year, less than a year, by the study, practice, and living of spiritual truth. Not by reading it merely or by hearing it, but by making it an active part of one's consciousness in daily experience until it becomes, let us say, a habit of thought, a habit of practice, instead of just an occasional thought or treatment or meditation. For as many years as the infinite way has been before the public, we have emphasized that point. In every class we have brought out that in uh, the Infinite Way, pages 97 to 103, there are passages, beginning with a statement on waking in the morning, giving us a sort of program, an outline of an activity of truth with which we can start our day and, to some extent, carry on during the day. Now, those who have never used those passages, those pages, those who have not yet trained themselves to that activity of consciousness would find it well worth their while. On waking in the morning to recognize God as the activity of the day, to recognize God as the substance of all that is to take place during the day, to recognize God as the law unto all that is to take place during the day, to recognize God as the one power and the one presence that will be met during the day. This is in fulfillment of scripture. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. And of course the great First commandment of the Master, Thou shalt have no other God. Thou shalt not acknowledge any other presence or power. Now, of course, we all believe that we are accepting God 
as the only power. We all believe that we are obedient to the first commandment. The truth is that none of us is wholly obedient to that commandment. And uh, that in proportion as we are obedient to it, does the fruitage come. How are we to be obedient to that commandment except by establishing within ourselves right from earliest morning that we will not recognize any other power than God. We will not recognize any power operating in our consciousness or in the consciousness of those with whom we come in contact except the power of God. Now, even though, let us say, subconsciously or unconsciously, you agree that this is true, every time you go out into the world, you will find that you are either fearing that your banker will say no when you want him to say yes, or your customer will say no when you want him to say yes, or uh, something in some way will be given to uh, some individual as a power over you. In other words, that something good may be withheld from you. There's in the day that we do not have the concern that there is some good of God which is at this moment being withheld from us. And why? We don't blame God. Oh no, here is someone who could give it to us and isn't. Here is someone who could be the means of our receiving it and isn't. In other words, we are placing power in man whose breath is in his nostril, and yet we're told, wherein is he to be accounted of? Now, if we were to begin our morning with a realization that no man can give to us and no man can withhold from us, and that means man, woman, or child. No one has it within their power to give to us or to withhold, since God is the source and activity of our good, and God is the only power. Now, as long as we are still entertaining, even mildly, the belief that good can be given to us or good can be withheld from us, we are not obeying that first commandment and we are preventing ourselves from receiving our good. The moment that we acknowledge, well, let us illustrate that here. Here we are gathered together in the name of truth. Now, it may be because of appearances that you believe that truth can come to you from me. And perhaps some of you even believe that that's why you are here tonight, to receive some measure of truth from me. There isn't a word of truth in that. You are not going to receive any truth from me. There never was any hope that you would receive truth from me. God is the source and the activity of all truth. And the only reason you are here is to receive an unfoldment, an experience of truth. But not from me, from God. Because I'm here for the same purpose that you are, to receive truth from God. It just so happens that at this moment, my body or my mouth or my tongue or my mind is being used as an instrument through which that truth is reaching us from God. I have no power to give you truth and I have no power to withhold truth. But if you are here in the realization that we are gathered together to receive truth of God, all of us will go away from here with some measure of God experience, of God truth received in consciousness. The only thing that can block it would be the belief on my part that I have truth to give you. 
or the belief on your part that I have truth to give you. That could very well block it. Now, I have been in this work long enough to know that I have no truth to give and none to withhold, but that as I hold myself in conscious union with God, truth flows through me from the Godhead to whoever is receptive and responsive. And in the same way, I have also learned this, that unless you are sitting there with some measure of spiritual agreement, you cannot receive the truth that is pouring itself forth. So in the last re uh, analysis, the responsibility is upon you to open yourselves, not to me, but to God, the truth, the truth itself. Now this applies in your human experience out in the world. If you go to a banker for a loan and actually believe he can give it or withhold it, you may sometimes get it and sometimes be denied. If you are holding in your consciousness that God is the source of your supply and at best man can be an instrument for its reaching you, then it will make no difference what this one or that one does. You will always have your supply made evident to you and before you need it. The blockage is in the belief that someone can give it or withhold it. If you are a salesman or a saleswoman, there is no better way to be a poor one and an underpaid one than to believe that merchants or customers can buy or not buy at their will and that your business is dependent upon the goodwill of these customers. That is a good way, a fine way to limit oneself. But to understand God as the activity of all business may not compel just Jones or Brown to buy from you when you would like to sell them, but it will result every week in an abundance of sales and many times not from those from whom you expect it. But what difference does it make what direction it comes from? The main thing is that it be in the books. Now then, this that I'm talking about is a principle of life, but one which will do us no good, except in proportion as we make it a conscious activity of thought. In other words, as we go out upon our day's work with the realization that God is the activity, the source, the substance of our supply, God is the source, activity, substance, law of our business, of our health, of our being, of all our human relationships. God must be made the central theme of our life. God must be made the actual source and avenue of our good. We have no right even to think of each other as channels because while we may be, it isn't necessary that God have a channel. So let us not be concerned about channels. Let us receive the activity of God direct within our being, within our consciousness. Now you see that while this has been a law throughout all ages, going far back before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it has been available only to those who first knew the law and then practiced it. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But you must know it. And not only you must know it, but you must make it a conscious part of your awareness, a conscious part of your living until that particular phase becomes automatic and you do far less conscious thinking about it. 
But then, of course, there comes other phases of life. You will find some of those covered in that booklet, Love and Gratitude. You see, love is one of the major points of our existence. We are made happy by love and through love, and we are made miserable by its absence. And there are all forms of love. There is the marital love and the parental love and the filial love and the brotherly and sisterly love and neighborly love and community love. But love is the word on any basis. And it is the absence of that love that makes many lives miserable. Why should there be an absence of love? Well, actually, there is no absence of love. There is an absence of the experience of love on our part through ignorance. We will illustrate that. In our human picture, we look to each other for love, for cooperation, for friendship. And therein, do we make our mistakes? God is love, and God is the activity of love, and we should look only to God for love. And because God is infinite and universal, when we find our love in God, we find it in each other. That's the mystery and the miracle. If we look to each other, we may find love today and hate tomorrow. We may find gratitude today and ingratitude tomorrow. We may find cooperation today and a lack of it tomorrow. But if we will realize God as the source of love, if we will recognize that all love, all love is an emanation of God, we will then meet with it in all whom we meet on this pathway. Oh, there are a few who will not respond to this, but they will drop out of our experience. And the rest of our world will be made up of those who do love us on uh, the plane of consciousness and in the way of love natural to the relationship. Now, this too has always been true, that God is love. Always this has been true, that God is love. And God being universal, that love is universal, ever-present, everywhere present. And yet you say, look at the amount of people who are not finding love, cooperation, friendship in this world, ah yes, because they have made the human mistake of looking to each other for it. Even parents look to their children and children look to their parents instead of both learning to look to God and then finding it in and through each other. In our happily departed depression, the great complaint was lack of supply. Most of you here remember those years. And you know now that there never was a lack of supply. You know now that the earth was just full of oil and diamonds and gold and silver. You know now that the land was full of wheat and cotton, vegetables and fruit. You know now that the air was full of birds. The hills were full of cattle. The oceans were full of fish. Where was the lack? There was as much in this country and in every country on the globe in those ten years of depression as there is now. There was no lack. The only, the only lack was in our ability to get some of it. The proof of that is the great amounts of it that were taken out to sea and thrown overboard. The great amounts that were burned up, just as is being done today. While many things are scarce, millions of dollars worth are being burned up so that we can't get them at too low a price. 
You see, there is no scarcity. There's an oversupply, if anything. So that instead of praying for supply, instead of going to God for supply, our task must be this, the acknowledgement and realization of God as the activity source and law of supply. Not looking to our jobs, not looking to our dollar bills, not looking to the government, not looking to benevolence, not looking to our rich relatives. Our work should have been then, and it must be now, the realization that God is our sufficiency. God is the source of our activity. God is the source of our supply. God is the avenue, the vehicle, the instrument of our supply. And looking only unto God, we are apt to have experiences like Moses, finding manna coming from the sky, if it can't come any other way, or water from the rock, or Elijah finding cakes baked on the very stones in front of Moa, ravens bringing food, or a widow sharing. Anything can happen, but one thing is certain to happen, and that is abundance. No one can miss abundance. The moment they take their gaze away from man whose breath is in his nostril and realize God as the source. Oh, you may say, but I do recognize God as the source. When do you, how often do you, and how consistently do you, or is it just an occasional thought about that while still looking to man whose breath is in his nostril? This must be a consistent activity. This must be a continuous activity until consciousness is so imbued with the realization of God as the source that after a while it becomes automatic. You do not have to consciously think of it very often and uh, the flow begins. So in every walk of our lives, in every avenue, it becomes necessary not merely to read books on truth, not merely to attend lectures or classes on truth or tape recordings on truth, those are fine activities as far as they go. But unless one picks them up from there and carries them out into the world as, a, as an activity of the conscious awareness, of the conscious mind, they are not apt to produce lasting fruit. Now, you say, that is hard work. And I think I'm one of those most free to admit that it's not only hard work, but much harder work than you think. Probably that is why the Master said that the way is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. For that very reason, the multitudes were willing <coughs> to come to the mountains and be fed and watch the loaves and fishes be multiplied. Oh yes, we will notice that there were always multitudes there. But there never were multitudes multiplying loaves and fishes. Oh, no. It was too easy to watch the other fellow do it and to benefit by it. And uh, in the end, it became necessary not only that the master stop feeding uh, the multitudes, but that he stop healing them. It just became too easy to walk out to the hill there and let the master say abacadabra and walk away well. But the master recognized that that was not getting anyone into the kingdom of heaven just to have a well body or a filled stomach. And so he finally said, if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. And oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, I would, I would love to have put my arm around you. I would love to have done these things for you but he would not. Yes, they would come out to the hills and listen. They would be a, the multitudes who sat at his feet and listened. 
but they would not go away and practice. And so, of all the multitudes the Master taught and preached to, we learn that only about 500 learned enough truth to recognize him when he walked the earth after the resurrection. Only 500 out of multitudes. How many must multitudes be? And the many multitudes he spoke to. We can be in that same position. We can be fed by practitioners and teachers, not only spiritually, but physically. And we can be healed by them. Once, twice, three times, ten times. But in the end, if we do not rise in consciousness ourselves to embodying this truth, then we will have lost our opportunity in this experience on earth for freedom. Now freedom, liberty, these are words that we speak, we think of, and they're conditions that we desire. Freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from lack. Freedom from limitation. Freedom from sin. Freedom from disease. Freedom from death. We think of those things. We desire those things. But they are no more to be gotten without struggle than national freedom can be achieved without struggle. We are told by Sir Francis Bacon when he founded the Masonic Order and sent the Master Masons to this continent to organize with the ideal of national liberty, political, economic, and religious, that the reason he didn't scatter these abroad in Europe was that there was no hope that the idea or ideal of liberty and freedom could take root there. People had for so long been enslaved, for so long had lived under the type of royalty of that day that they no longer had what it takes to strike out for liberty and freedom. And so he said it would have to be done on a new continent with a people of pioneer spirit who had the backbone to break away from tradition and easy living or hard living and uh, begin the struggle for freedom and so beginning back in the 1600s the pilgrims the pioneers the early settlers came to this country and uh, with them came the masonic order but it took until 1776 wasn't it until the boston tea party took place a strike a blow for freedom struck by St. John's Lodge No. 1 of Boston, Massachusetts, free and accepted Masons. They were the ones who went out to the ship and threw the tea overboard and made that blow, struck that first blow for freedom. And then came those hard campaigns of the war, of which you read in school books. Hard, hard experiences those men and women went through in those days to give us a constitution guaranteeing us economic freedom, political freedom, and religious freedom. So you know by that experience that freedom and liberty is not easily achieved. And those who have had any awareness at all of political history of the last 20 years know that it's been more difficult to maintain than it was to achieve. The efforts that have been made in this country in the last 20 years to save this country from going totalitarian will only be known in school books in years to come. How very close this nation was to coming under totalitarian government isn't even dreamed of by the citizens. Even those who read the newspapers and know that we had a rubber stamp Congress and a washed out Supreme Court, even the people who've read that do not realize that they were right on the brink of totalitarian government 
and that it has taken and is right now taking the brain work, the hard work of hundreds of men, brilliant men, successful men, to prevent experiences coming about in this country that could even now or within the next few years lead to a totalitarian form of government. Because if your finances aren't saved, if your business structure isn't saved, your political and religious structure will not be saved. That's hard work to achieve it, hard work to maintain it. Those who have been on the spiritual path will tell you that it is a very hard work to achieve one's spiritual freedom in Christ. Freedom from material limitation. Freedom from material law. Freedom from any form, moral limitation. All forms of limitation that hedge the human being in. It's a difficult thing. But this they will also tell you. Having achieved it, it's more difficult to retain afterward than it was to attain. The mesmerism of the world is such that it is a very simple matter to succumb again to the temptations of the world. Oh, each one may fall in a different way, but the fall is there for those who are not careful, who are not alert, who do not consciously use every ounce of awareness within their possession to maintain and sustain their spiritual integrity. And you say, well, if it's that hard work, is it worth having? Well, anyone who has been in slavery to an insufficient purse or an insufficient body, strength, health, anyone who has been in slavery to false desires, false appetites, will well know that any struggle and every struggle is worthwhile to get out of it. And that leads up to the subject of our work for this year. And this isn't easy. But it's beautiful. And the results are wonderful. Our students this year should rise higher than ever before in healing consciousness. I said to begin with, we must be doers of the word. To speak truth, to write truth, to lecture on truth or teach truth is a very wicked thing if it isn't accompanied by healing. Because healing is the one evidence of the truth of a spiritual message. When the Master was asked, Art thou he that should come? That was his answer. Go show John what things you have seen. The sick are healed. The dead are raised. That is our answer today. When you ask, is the infinite way effective? Is it true? Is it the truth? There's only one answer to make. Not yes, I believe so. The answer is, in proportion to the healings that you witness, must you judge it. And if you practice it faithfully, then we can say further, in proportion to the healings that you achieve, uh, are you demonstrating its truth. Ever since I have been in this work, the healing work has been a major activity, not because of the importance of changing sick people into well, but because of the importance of revealing a principle through which we can get rid of ill health and find our true health in God, our spiritual health. Now anything that can bring to us greater health, greater harmony, greater supply, or that can enable us to bring these freedoms to our family or friends or patients or students is worth our while. And so it becomes necessary that we practice, practice these lessons of truth so as to develop our consciousness. 
Now let me tell you secret number one about the healing work, which is also supplying work or raising from the dead work. It isn't the truth you know that does the work. It isn't the truth you learn that does the work. It isn't the truth you read that does the work. It is the measure of Christ consciousness that you attain that does the work. Healing is not done by knowing the truth in uh, an intellectual sense of knowing it. Many people can read a book and memorize it at one reading. It will heal anybody of anything. Many people have learned thoroughly the textbooks on healing, the many textbooks that have been written, and some of them very good ones, and yet have done no healing and uh, may not even have accomplished healing for themselves. And the reason is that healing isn't done by the truth you know. Healing is done by the truth consciousness you attain. In other words, as you know the truth, as you take in the truth through reading, studying, hearing, practicing, it develops your consciousness of truth. It develops your spirituality, your spiritual awareness. The same as studying music develops your musical consciousness. Studying art develops your artistic consciousness. So the study and practice of truth develops your spiritual consciousness. And then it is the spiritual consciousness that does the work. Once you have attained some measure of spiritual consciousness, you do not have too much to do in the way of treatment or study. You have most to do to maintain that consciousness, to live and move in that consciousness and uh, hold it high away from the mesmerism of the world. And so the beginning of wisdom is the study of truth. Whether you study from books, from recordings, from teachers, from lectures or classes, the main thing is to study. Use one of those methods or all. The more of them you use, the greater the development and uh, the quicker the development. But remember this, that all of that study is leading to the attainment of that mind which was in Christ Jesus, to some measure of that Christ consciousness, and it is that Christ consciousness that does the work. What does Christ consciousness or spiritual consciousness consist of? How do we aim, how do we direct our study toward the attainment of spiritual consciousness? Well, now let me show you. <clears throat> Material consciousness is a state of consciousness that places its hope or faith or reliance in the outer world. In other words, a materially minded man says that to go from here to San Francisco costs so and so many dollars. And the trip is dependent upon having so and so many dollars. The spiritually minded man says the trip is dependent upon the grace of God. Now, you can't see the grace of God or hear it or taste it or touch it or smell it. So you have to be spiritually minded to place your faith and reliance upon that which you never can see, hear, taste, touch, or smell, the infinite invisible. The materially minded man says, aspirin is good for a headache, and this medicine is good for this ill. But the spiritually minded man says health is an activity of God and uh, the grace of God is the source of my health. Again, your spiritually minded man turns to the invisible and knows that that which is visible 
is but the outer effect of that which is invisible. So it is. We have a book here called the Bible. And we know its value. How did the book get into existence except from the invisible consciousness of the saints and sages and seers and prophets who spoke these words or wrote these words? Out of the invisible came these words into visibility. Well now, if you live on these words, you miss the opportunity for more of the same words to come from the same source that these came from. These words will only help you get back into the invisible where the source of these words begins to flow through you. Any living on an effect is a living on a husk. But living in the realization of the invisible as the source of the visible is really living on the substance of life. We do not live by bread alone. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It doesn't say we should stop eating bread. But it does say we do not live by bread alone. Bread is not the staff of life. The word of God is the staff of life. And that doesn't mean just reading words in a book, but the words that flow from the invisible within you to the visible. So it is. You may be searching the stores for some article of merchandise. And naturally, the human belief is that if you just go to enough stores, you're bound to find it ultimately at the price you desire. That's the human way of going about it. But the spiritual way of going about it is to realize that whatever it is, it isn't out in the store. It's a gift of God within you. That's why you're desiring it, because it's already been given to you within. And your desire is to see it made manifest in the without. And as you realize that it is already established within you, in the invisible, in some way, in some manner, you're led to the very store at the very moment when it's being put out on the counter. And there it is waiting for you. Never, never, when you're a student of this work, even go to the market for food without that realization that the real substance is within you, that you do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then when you do your marketing, you find the time you save and the money you save by the fact that this very spiritual realization has directed you in a direct manner. It is true in every walk of life that before you undertake anything, you turn to the source of it, and the source of it is God. The source of anything and everything in this world is God, even a vacation. God. God is the source, the activity, the substance. And so, to become spiritually minded means to become reliant and dependent upon the infinite invisible. We are told in Scripture, He hangeth the earth on nothing. And I'm sure now you can recognize the fact that this world isn't hanging on anything. It isn't at all. It's hanging in space. And whatever it is that's holding it up is invisible. It isn't on any atlas's shoulder except the invisible atlas, the creative principle of this world we become more and more spiritual and we become less and less dependent on the physical processes of life, on the external values of life. And so, our entire work in this work is the development of that consciousness. Then, 
as that consciousness develops and unfolds, you are presented with pictures outside that we call pictures of error, sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation. But now, as these pictures are presented, you behold the invisible as the source of, our, of harmony, and the picture begins to change. That is what constitutes a practitioner or a teacher who knows the practice. That is the ability not to accept an appearance at face value, but to know always that the invisible is the reality of all that exists, and let that truth remove this discordant appearance. Going back to that uh, great commandment of the Master, the first, if we acknowledge God as the only power, the only source, the only law, watch what happens when you are faced with laws of infection or contagion, laws of weather, laws of heredity, laws of climate, laws of food. The moment you have recognized God as the one and only law, you immediately begin to nullify every belief of heredity, of food, climate, weather, infection, contagion. All material law is nullified in proportion as you accept God as the only law, the one law. Thou shalt have no other God, no other law, but spirit, the spiritual law. And so you develop a habit. Every time legal law, economic law, political law, physical law comes to your attention, your thought goes back to the fact, ah, yes, thank you, Father, I know. There's only one law, and that's the law of God, since... There is but one God, there can be but one law. Since God is spirit, law must be spiritual. In the same way, you have conditions of body that you're continually meeting. And uh, these conditions testify to growth or to a lack of bodily substance. And there again, if you have God as one and acknowledge no other God, you can acknowledge only one substance, and that substance would be God. And there can't be an overabundance of God, and there can't be an insufficiency of God. And pretty soon you find that the body is showing forth the normalcy of God, of divine substance. Now then, we have God as substance, we have God as law, we have God as life. Well now, we are all being confronted with pictures of diseased life, aged life, dead life. But if we have acknowledged that first commandment, and we will have no other God but God, and God is life, we will have no other life than God. Is there a young life? Is there a new life? Is there an old life? Is there a weak life? Is there a dead life? Is there a diseased life? How so if God is life, and if God is one, then life is one. And as thought becomes imbued with that, every appearance of diseased life, or dead life, or old life, or too young life, all of this begins to fade, and we become aware of the one harmonious perfect life expressed as your and my individual being. But remember, this is all true, just as true as the laws of uh, automotive engineering were true back in the days of Jesus Christ, but nobody availed themselves of it. The days of the, the laws of aeroplaning were known long, well, in existence long before the Wright brothers and long before Jesus. But only now are we availing ourselves of laws that have eternally existed. And so I say to you, the spiritual law of God has existed since before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am, but we haven't availed ourselves of it. 
What we have done is accepted the appearance. I was born on a certain day. You were born on a certain day. I'm near the end of my road, or you're near the end of your road. And so we start to get weaker, and so on down the line. Who says so? We have accepted that you have a life, and I have a life, and the newborn babe has a life. And that isn't true. It's true that we have a life, but it's not true that we have a life of our own. The only life we have is God. As this becomes embedded and embodied in consciousness, we become aware of the vital life, the spiritual life within us at all times and in all ages. You can go through every synonym of God that you know and find that belief has made these personal to you and to me. But that spiritual awareness reveals that since there is only one God, there is only one life, one love, one substance, one law, one activity, one cause, one effect. And as this becomes embodied and embedded, you become a healer. Not necessarily a public practitioner. The day may be over for those, or nearly over. But you become a practitioner to all those within your circle who desire spiritual healing. Now, the development of spiritual consciousness is possible to anyone on earth. The degree of it is entirely dependent on what you wish to put into it. You cannot get out of uh, your life more spirituality than you are willing to put in in effort. The person who devotes an hour a day to this work will develop some degree of spirituality, not much, but some.